All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you again for, for joining us today uh, for the Drones in Agriculture uh, webinar that is co-hosted between DJI and SlantRange, one of our payload SDK partners. So before we get started, quick round of introduction for the panelists. My name is Bill. Uh, I work at DJI as an Enterprise Partnerships Manager. I've been with the company for uh, a little over two and a half years. Um, moved around quite a bit and now work primarily in the in the enterprise space um, on our strategic partnerships. Joining us today on the panel is Mike Ritter, uh, CEO of SlantRange, uh, as well as uh, Matthew Barry, the uh, Director of Strategic Development over at SlantRange as well. So over the last year uh, here at DGI, we've really identified six core pillars that are necessary for uh, end users to implement a successful drone program. Now, um, as we know, you know, it's not really efficient for DGI to go around and create our own solutions for every single one of these pillars. Uh, of course, we are currently known as a hardware platform company in this space um, with a suite of our own existing payloads. But at the same time, we work very closely with ecosystem partners like SlantRange to uh, round out our commercial UAV solutions that are available. Um, in addition to that, we also work with several software training, uh, support and integration partners as well in order to achieve operational success for our enterprise uh, customers. So I'm sure as many, many of our attendees today here know, um, we provide drone hardware solutions across the spectrum from commercial off-the-shelf products like the Mavic 2 Enterprise um, or the Phantom 4 RTK that just launched recently, uh, all the way over to industrial platforms that are more versatile um, and really are the backbone of our offering, like the Matrice 200 series. In addition to that, we are also uh, not just in the, in the data collection space for drones. Um, we also have an in-house Agris uh, MG1P series product um, that acts upon insights, uh, agricultural insights that are collected uh, as part of the DJI slant range solution uh, that we offer. And as I mentioned earlier, really the Matrice 200 series is DJI Enterprise's backbone product. Uh, it's really built for enterprise applications from the ground up uh, and versatility is really the key offering that we're, we're pushing. Um, in addition, uh, it has IP43 weather resistance, so dust and water resistance, um, extreme cold tolerance with self-heating batteries, uh, a carbon fiber construction which allows for um, a, a, over a four pound payload capacity, uh, as well as of course a hard shell case to protect against, uh, against any damage during operations. Now, as I mentioned earlier, DJI also provides a suite of in-house payloads ranging from the Zemu's XT series cameras that we co-developed with FLIR uh, to the optical zoom camera, the Zemu's Z30, as well as, of course, our in-house uh, Zemu's X5S um, RGB camera. Now, as part of our partnership with Slant Range, really, we brought the idea of, of the payload SDK to market uh, in the March of this year. Uh, and the goal of Payload SDK is to work more closely with our ecosystem partners that um, provide specialized expertise in several verticals. Um, Slamage, of course, being one of our, our closest partners in the space. Now, if there's any interest in, in developing with DJI as a Payload SDK partner, I'm happy to address additional questions uh, at the end of the webinar as well. The, the toolkit that allows uh, our partners to develop successfully on top of the payload SDK uh, offering is, is, of course, the DJI Skyport adapter. Now, it gives you access to the power supply on board the drone, uh, the wireless communication link with the DJI remote controller, um, aircraft status information that is uh, ex exported from the flight controller of the aircraft itself, as well as various APIs to integrate with our existing commercial offerings, ranging from the mobile SDK to the onboard SDK. So here you can see what the Skyport module looks like. Uh, it serves as an adapter um, and allows the, the, uh, allows the link between the existing uh, payload as well as our uh, Matrice 200 series aircraft. So 
So several key features are allowed as part of the Payload SDK integration, uh, everything from seamless data transmission to DJI pilot support. Uh, we work very closely with our Payload SDK development partners in order to ensure a, a superior user experience uh, and seamless integration as well. So currently, the Payload SDK offerings are compatible with all Matrice 200 series platforms, and the strategy on DJI side is, of course, to move forward, uh, ensuring backwards compatibility as well on future uh, future enterprise aircraft on our side. So since March of 2018 this year, um, we've seen a huge amount of interest from the developer community. Um, we've onboarded 25 developers who have collectively developed over 20 prototype units, five of which are currently in production, of course, three are released uh, and market ready at this current moment in time. And with that, I'd like to pass it over to Mike over at Slant Range to continue the, the webinar presentation uh, about the joint solution. Thanks, Bill. Um, so this is this is Mike Ritter at, at Slant Range. Um, what I wanted to do is, uh, first of all, thanks thanks to DJI uh, for inviting us to to participate in the webinar. But uh, more than that, uh, uh, getting involved with us as a partner. Uh, just just a little over a year ago, we started talking about uh, the, the payload SDK uh, plans that DJI had, and um, what, what we could do as a payload developer in terms of integrating our, our packages. So, um, you know, the, the, the M200 series is a fantastic, uh, rugged, reliable, uh, industrial commercial drone, and, and we think an ideal uh, platform uh, for, for our payloads and analytics, uh, which are targeting agriculture. So what I wanted to do today was uh, give you a little bit of a, an introduction to, to who we are uh, as, as a company. Um, uh, talk to you specifically about uh, some of the challenges that are involved with with the agriculture vertical, uh, which and then get a, get a little bit into the technology of our solution and talk to everybody who's always interested in how these systems are being used in the world. Uh, talk through a couple of you know interesting use cases, uh, and at the end, kind of kind of putting it all together, uh, show you how how these this system has been integrated uh, into a package that is having a really a, a transformative effect on, on uh, agricultural practices uh, at this point, uh, approaching uh, 50 countries around the world. And then, of course, we'll open up for questions at the end. So um, anyway, jumping right in, uh, a quick background on, on us as a company. Um, uh, our team has actually been developing uh, aerial sensing uh, and analytics systems for going back to the late 90s, uh, working across a couple of different domains originally. Uh, in the earth sciences uh, arena, uh, and then moving into about a decade, we spent developing specialized payloads and analytic systems for, for military uh, and intelligence applications. Um, and what we learned over that period of time was that, uh, you know, not only were we exposed and developed some really uh, unique technologies for, for aerial uh, monitoring of what's going on on the ground, uh, we recognize that you know there's a huge potential for these types of technologies to be applied in, in different industry verticals, and we quickly focused on agriculture uh, as as a, as a target in terms of you know this this type of technology will absolutely transform uh, agricultural practices around the world for the better, uh, and we want to be on the leading end of that. Um, so today, uh, our our products encompass a couple of different pieces. One uh, is a uh, sensing technology that uh, is, uh, I'll get into more detail on this, but a, a spectral imaging device that is, is mounted to uh, a drone um, and conducts specialized measurements of, of agricultural crops. Uh, we have an analytics package that delivers on-site results uh, within just a couple of minutes of measurements. Um, we have back-end analytics that enable some deeper level of analyses for, for better understanding crop performance. Um, and a couple of other points here. We we were excited to be a founding member of the Drone Advocacy Network, which, if 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 uh, or if you're not familiar with, um, is is a group of of industry partners that are are working together with lawmakers to try to advance uh, the the cause of of what we can do with uh, drones across multiple different industry applications. Uh, we were 
one of DJI's launch partners for, for the uh, PSDGA uh, or DJI Skype court earlier this year, which we were excited to be part of. And then most recently, just two weeks ago, we, we announced our partnership with Microsoft, which is uh, built around uh, what we can do with really some advanced analytics uh, in terms of extending these capabilities to on-site processing. So let's talk about the challenge, uh, particularly with agriculture. Um, it's 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 a bit unique uh, in terms of not not only uh, the, the the obstacles to technology development and implementation, but uh, it, it is unique in terms of of what uh, you know the benefits will be once once these uh, problems are solved. But um, just to, to kind of frame the discussion a little bit, um, you know. These are the types of challenges that we that we face, both as technology developers and and for service providers out there. Uh, just as kind of a in a, in a use case here, you know, common requirements. Uh, there's a broad span of data products that may be of interest to an agricultural producer uh, that go well beyond just taking aerial images. They're interested in plant counts, plant size, uh, characterizing all levels of plant development of course across the growing season. Um, so these are unique data products that you don't just get straight from imagery. Um, these results need to be delivered relatively quickly for, for action if there's emerging issues. Um, and in many cases, some of, some of the larger enterprise growers, you know, global operations, so just as an example, you know, 250,000 hectares spread, spread across 12, 75 farms in, in 12 countries. Um, and being able to collect and deliver results on that on that scale is is really a challenge. Um, and, and on top of that, there are, of course, uh, you know, security uh, concerns around making sure data uh, is secure, uh, both from from collection to, to to transportation and ultimately to consumption. So, as technology developers, we got to make sure we do address all of these these concerns uh, to really to help scale uh, uh, for for our growing partners. So. Of course, at the root of the of the uh, entire uh, the enterprise here is uh, delivering data that's really of value to to the grower at the end of the day. So we we kind of we came up with this uh, structure a few years ago, and we we characterize data value on on two axes. One is actionability in terms of can the delivered data uh, affect uh, a decision uh, that that can positively impact uh, the growing the growing conditions for the producer. And secondarily, on the availability scale, is that data available at the time, the place, and the cost that are necessary to make that decision? And if you score highly on both of those axes, then you really have a high data value. And what we wanted to do was map out, you know, if you look at agriculture across the spectrum of different methods of collecting data from, from human scouts in the field on one end of the spectrum to satellites uh, on the other, uh, what you quickly realize is that each of the options today are, are, are kind of constrained within a, a, a certain regime of this this particular uh, this chart here. Human scouts can produce very actionable information, uh, but they score low on the availability scale because they're they're relatively sparse. Uh, similarly, with with ground sensors on, on the opposite end of the spectrum, satellites can cover huge swaths of ground, uh, but the actionability of the information is is relatively low. And, and, the, and the, really the reason that we uh, entered this space is we saw the a low altitude remote sensing system on low cost commercial drones uh, could really uh, break out into the upper right of this chart like none of these others will, will be able to do for, for, for a mix of reasons. And, and that's, that's, that's been our focus. So I'm gonna go a little bit into detail here on, on the technology behind what we're doing because it is important. I think that uh, a, a lot of people are interested in what uh, drones can do for agriculture, uh, but uh, you know, wading into the technology can be a, a bit confusing and it's a little deep sometimes. So I'm gonna pre present the high level uh, points here. Um, uh, there's, there's a couple of pieces. For, first of all, uh, the, the, the sensing systems are, are doing a couple of things. Uh, they're, they're, they're measuring the, the plant sizes and the shapes from, from the imagery, but they're also uh, measuring how sunlight interacts with the, the plant canopy. Uh, and it's that interaction of sunlight that tells us about the, the chemical and the physical composition of, of individual plants. And, and what I've put up here is a chart uh, that shows plant reflectance across uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. 
uh, from the visible range, which is uh, near the rainbow area you can see around 500. That's, that's what humans can, can perceive. Uh, and then moving into the near infrared, which is uh, above about 650 or 700 nanometers. Uh, and this is where specialized sensors can do measurements of the canopy, uh, the plant canopy, but humans uh, really can't perceive this. But uh, what we're doing is trying to look at uh, how much sunlight is being absorbed or reflected by the plant canopy because that tells us about the pigments that may be present and that tells us a little bit about nutrient conditions uh, or pest conditions and things like that. Uh, so the sensor systems are, are designed uh, to do these measurements. Uh, of course, the second piece is analyzing those measurements to, to actually generate some useful information uh, for the grower at the end of the day. And if you've been Looking at or using drone systems uh, so far, you may be familiar uh, with the first two steps, which are basically image pre-processing and geo-registration. And most packages out there do these two things and ultimately will give you a, an ortho mosaic or, or a map of, of a field. Um, maybe it's just a color, a color image, but sometimes it might be a specialized uh, tool like NDVI. Um, but there's so much more that can be done uh, if you've got high enough resolution imagery. Uh, from feature segmentation and statistics, uh, time histories and forecasting. Uh, there's a lot more that you can do with the data, and that's what I'm going to dive into here and give you a little bit more background. So um, just uh, a little bit on, on the technology ar ar around um, measuring how sunlight interacts with the plant. So uh, what we're showing here is um, the signature of sunlight on, on the left uh, as it comes down at, at 12 o'clock noon. Uh, and then the, the measurement of what sunlight is reflected back off of that, uh, that plant that comes back up to our sensor system. And what the sensor is measuring is both of these things at the same time. And, and doing that is important for, for uh, well, there's a very, very important reason uh, both measurements are done simultaneously. Because uh, if you come back at 4 p.m. and repeat your measurement, uh, the signature of sunlight will have changed. And that correspondingly is going to change what you actually measure um, being reflected off the plant canopy. And if you're not doing this measurement accurately, you're going to get different measurements depending on when you do the measurement. Of course, um, uh, that's not very useful for growers. If you go out there and you take some measurements and, and think you might have an issue, uh, it may just be a function of the sunlight changing uh, from the last time you did the measurement. So uh, we introduced this technology a few years ago that uh, measures both the sunlight and the reflectivity of the plant canopy at the same time so that we can normalize the measurements or correct them. So uh, independent of when you go out and do the measurement, independent of cloud conditions, uh, you're going to get the same measurement. Uh, that's really important so that you can compare data over time. And it's the ability to compare data over time that allows you to start developing forecasting models and things like that. And that's, that's really, uh, really valuable it's, and it's really important. Um, anyway, we, we've, uh, we established this technology a few years ago. Uh, we have two, two patents in the U.S. on this and actually just uh, got our first international patent in Australia uh, a couple of weeks ago on this technique. Um, accuracy in, in data um, goes beyond just the measurement. It involves how the analytics are, are conducted. And, and what I'm showing here are three images uh, uh, of an early season cornfield. Uh, at, this is a 10 meter by 10 meter square uh, viewed at the resolutions uh, representative of satellites, manned aircraft, or low altitude drone system. And what you can see uh, on the far left uh, for satellite images, you get relatively uniform greenish looking um, image uh, that you can't discern very much from due to the, the relatively low resolution uh, of the image. What you're getting is you know, the crop, you know, the, the, the plants are being mixed with soil backgrounds uh, due, to this, due to poor resolution. The manned aircraft has higher resolution and you can start beginning to make out some of the row structure, uh, but the resolution is still uh, mixing together uh, the plant material and the background soil. So from a data point of view, it's really no better than a satellite image. But what you can do with the image on the right, uh, the resolution is higher than the individual plant leaves, and that enables you to start doing all kinds of new things on the data end that you can't do with the two options on the left. Um, you can start segmenting out uh, the, the plant matter from the background soils, 
uh, you can start separating individual plants, classifying different types of plants, uh, and doing this enables far more uh, accurate measurements of what's going on with the plant canopy at any point in time, but it also um, enables you to generate new types of data products that have really high value, and I'm going to jump into those in just a minute, but putting these two pieces together uh, is, is just kind of a sample image here. Uh, this happens to be, again, an early season cornfield. Uh, just a, this is an image collected in the near infrared. Uh, that's, that's why the, the plants look kind of bright white. Uh, this is outside the range of, of human vision. But when we apply these steps, uh, if you take a close look at the image on the right, the first thing we want to do is remove information that's related to the soil background. So we go ahead and we can filter that out. Now we're just left with what is the growing vegetation. And what we see here is that there's a mix of different plant types. If you look closely, there's, there's corn growing, but there's also uh, other plant types or weeds. Uh, when we have sufficient resolution and the, the right spectral signatures, we can uh, begin separating these plant types. And what I've highlighted here in orange are, are weeds. Uh, and now we can, we can remove the weeds from the imagery as well. And now we're just left with the growing corn vegetation. And now we can start conducting our analysis on, on, on the corn, and in this particular case, uh, we can just show chlorophyll uh, based on a, a known academic model for extracting chlorophyll content based on, on this type of imagery. Um, but anyway, this is just, a, just an example of uh, what you can do with the appropriate resolution of imagery and, and, and how that can make your results so much more, more accurate, which is, uh, gets down to the actionability of information is really dependent on, on, on how accurate your measurements are. The other uh, uh, constraint around, around using uh, remote sensing systems in agriculture comes down to uh, scalability. Uh, and if you look at the different options here, uh, on, the, on the upper left is a map of where the world's farmlands are. About 37% of the world's land is, is devoted to agriculture. For satellites, they're constrained because at any given point in time, close to 70% of the Earth's surface is covered uh, by clouds. Now, um, depending on where you live, uh, you might have cloud cover almost all the time, or you might be uh, blessed with a lot of sunshine. But um, what it makes is satellites are relatively unreliable for uh, timely delivery of information when you might need it. On the bottom left is a map of where the world's airports are. Now, for, for manned aircraft-based systems operating in the U.S., we are, we are blessed with a lot of general aviation airports uh, that are within relatively close range of agricultural crops. But that's not true around most of the rest of the world. So um, if you run through all the math, you, you, you determine that you know, over 70% of the world's farms are not really accessible by survey aircraft in an economic sense. So drones have the advantage of being able to operate underneath the weather uh, where satellites are constrained. And you can deploy a small drone virtually anywhere on the planet, uh, which is unlike a manned aircraft. So they have a great scalability capability where the others don't. Um, of course, the issue with the small drone is if you're collecting huge volumes of, of, of data to, to produce some of the results that I was just showing you, uh, you quickly run into a problem around computing power. And the question is, how do you process uh, your data uh, efficiently uh, in some of these remote locations? So we looked at this problem early on and uh, basically decided a different approach was needed. Um, the techniques that are used to stitch ortho mosaics together are, are based largely on the, you know, the, the algorithms that uh, you use on your, on your phone maybe to put together a panorama images. And they um, are very effective for some applications, but for agricultural, uh, they're, they're not very efficient or effective. So we came up with a new method. Um, <clears throat> uh, most applications out there recognizing how computationally intensive it is to process drone data has fo have followed the model of well, collect your data in the field and push it all up to the cloud to be processed, and then we'll push it, a result back down to you. Um, our approach is a bit different here. So what we've done is pushed, come up with a more efficient processing solution that allows us all, all the data to be, to be processed uh, on location without any internet connection uh, within a couple of minutes of the flight. Um, if you do have an internet connection, of course, you can push results up into the cloud to be to be analyzed in the context of other data you may be collecting across your enterprise if you're if you're a large growing operation. Um, there's a couple of real key advantages here. Uh, 
first and foremost, uh, the, the method of processing that we're using enables you to collect data about four times faster than alternate methods. And, and what this means is, uh, uh, you know, copter, uh, rotary-based aircraft or, or quadcopter type systems like the Matrice series, uh, it enables you to cover four times as much ground in a flight than you would otherwise using a different processing technique. And that basically, you know, enables uh, rotorcraft to start competing with fixed wing aircraft in terms of area coverage. And if, if you're working in agriculture, you recognize area coverage uh, is the driving uh, variable for, it, for the economics of the business. Processing costs are substantially lower because it's, it's just, it's a much more efficient uh, processing technique. Um, you get results immediately on site within a few minutes. And you can do this anywhere, anytime. Uh, again, there's no need to be uh, connected to the internet. You uh, don't have, a, have to have a lot of computing power on, uh, on site to do this. So to, to jump through a couple of uh, kind of real world cases here, um, I, I've got a couple. The first is um, one of the biggest uh, interest uh, points in agriculture, which is a variable rate uh, application of inputs. So uh, traditionally, what is done is to blanket apply inputs, whether it's a fertilizer or, or, or a pesticide, um, uh, due to lack of information on where where the inputs should be applied and in what amounts. Um, so what we're what we're trying to do here is uh, produce a prescriptive map for the grower so that they can they can meter out their their inputs uh, where they're needed, and that that does a couple of things. It saves uh, on their input costs. And it allows them to make more targeted applications. So uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's at about improved yield. So um, this is a case. This was a, a corn grower in the U.S. Uh, did a survey of their field and produced uh, the map that I'm showing. And you can see that there's variable conditions here. There's the greenish areas are relatively uh, healthier uh, corn areas, and the red areas are showing uh, some nitrogen deficiency. And the grower went out there and was able to quickly assess the conditions on the ground with, the, with some soil samples and, and determined that uh, there is plenty of nitrogen in the soil in these red areas, uh, but it wasn't it had not yet been uptaken uh, by the by the crop for, for a couple of uh, couple of reasons. But ultimately, the agronomist decided to come up with a, a variable rate prescription uh, for fertilizer application. Uh, and that's what's shown on, on the right here. Um, so there's a use case that this particular grower put together around this, but at the end of the day, uh, between this cost and, and save, saved uh, fertilizer inputs and in, in the increased yields, the estimate was about a $35 per, a $35 per acre profit increase. Um, to put that into context, the total investment in the technology and the time to produce this result uh, uh, the break even was about 325 acres. Uh, so, uh, for this particular user in this particular case, uh, the technology investment and the time invested uh, paid off relatively quickly. If you're interested in the, in the details on this, there's there's a relatively extensive blog on on our website. The next case is is actually in a specialty crop. This happens to be lettuce in in California, and in this particular case, we're not looking at. Uh, you know, pests or fertilizers necessarily, but in this particular case, the lettuce grower uh, knew that there was a substantial weed growth in this field, and, and uh, lettuce is a labor-intensive, uh, costly crop to to harvest. It's it's all manual labor to 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 do the harvest. So, given the extent of weed growth, they were trying to decide: is it worth sending a harvest crew out there to harvest this field? So. What they're able to do with our system, this is just a, a high resolution color image on the right with a, with a, a blown up square there, uh, show you in, in more detail. The software can isolate individual plants and segment them by plant type. Uh, and what I'm showing here is uh, the, the lettuce heads are in green, the, uh, the weeds are identified in red, and I can just flicker back and forth between the two and you can see the software segmenting those two things. With that information, we're able to produce a map of what the lettuce population is in terms of heads per acre, and also look at the lettuce head size. And it's the combination of those two pieces of information that allows the grower to produce a, an estimate of what the actual yield in the field is prior to sending a harvest team out. So why is that important? 
uh, it ultimately allows the grower to decide whether they want to to invest in the harvest crew. And in this particular case, uh, the extent of weed growth was so large that it was ultimately decided not to not to harvest this field. This is a um, actually a, a pineapple field in, in Latin America, uh, similar to the, the lettuce example I just showed. Uh, this is a, an enterprise grower that has operations on multiple continents and their visibility into production at any stage of growth is relatively limited. They, they don't really have a, a number for yield until uh, the farm has been harvested and, and then at only at the farm level. Uh, so we're able to apply similar techniques and count and size individual pineapple fruit uh, in the field uh, during the growing season prior to harvest. And what this enables uh, for this particular grower is the ability to visualize uh, very quickly how yields are developing on a, on a more granular level across their operations. And that uh, enables them to react more quickly to changing conditions. It enables them to understand which management practices are, are performing better than others and then uh, adjust their, their practices accordingly. Um, this is an example for um, what we call aerial phenotyping, which is uh, for uh, breeders or seed producers uh, running trials on how different uh, hybrids or different input types will perform in real world conditions. Uh, part of our service offering uh, includes this, this, this type of example here where uh, we are characterizing the development of individual test plots throughout the growing season, delivering a mix of data from uh, the plant population uh, showing there at the, at the far left, uh, vegetation fraction, plant size, chlorophyll index, a number of variables that characterize the development of this particular trial throughout the growing season. And we can conduct this over tens of thousands of individual trials. Um, and ultimately what the, what the seed producer can do then is start characterizing how different programs that they may be running, which a program being a, a given mix of, of inputs, uh, perform in real world conditions. Uh, and start visualizing how these uh, how these crops are developing uh, and, and will develop in, in real world. So uh, this is really enabling for not only deciding which which combination of inputs will work best in real world conditions, but forecasting uh, how they're how, how they'll perform. I just one more example here, which is is kind of a, a neat example showing how um, some of the edge processing that we talked about earlier are enabling users to uh, develop tools for their own purposes. Um, there's a capability that's been built into the analytics that allows the user to train the software to look for signals that it may be of interest to them. Uh, just a couple of quick examples here. This is a, a watermelon grower looking for particular weed growth. And what you see here is a color image, but in, in blue is highlighted uh, this particular weed uh, strain that's growing in this field. An alfalfa grower looking for saturated soil, they're, they're using the software uh, to train on uh, soil moisture contents that are uh, above a certain level. And what you can see in this particular image is uh, there was a leaking irrigation system that's picked up by the system. And then there's an insurance client uh, looking to characterize how much uh, damage may have been done by a wind event and looking for lodged plants. And again, this is uh, the, the system has been trained to look for signals uh, that are particular to to lodged plants. So um, there's a uh, just just to summarize quickly on on these different use cases. There there are an immense range of applications in agriculture. Uh, what we've shown are just kind of a mix that cover a di different examples, but um, also built into the tools the ability for users to train to their own applications. And and we have more examples like this of uh, people training it to their own purposes every day. So uh, coming back to just putting it all together, um, you know, as, as Bill uh, started off the, uh, the webinar with a discussion of, of the, the M200 series, uh, the PSDK integration with the Skyport, um, we have integrated our payload system onto the M200 series through this integration. Um, and it gives you some, some great advantages that I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you here in the next couple of slides. Um, the first thing is that uh, there's there's multiple flight planning options. The, the DJI Ground Station Pro is is uh, the implementation there is currently in, in development, uh, but we have active uh, options and drone deploy and flight plan for DJI that enable uh, a quick um, 
operation of the system uh, real easily in the field. So just as, as an example here, this is drone deploy. Um, <clears throat> in the bottom left of, of, the, of your flight planning screen, uh, you have the ability to select your sensor type. Um, and given what you're trying to measure in the field, you, we, you can enter the plant, the plant length, the plant, basically the plant size, um, and it will recommend a flight speed and a flight altitude to, to collect the data you're after. Uh, once your mission is planned, um, you get a status on the system. This is all again through the through the hand controller. You have direct access to data from the from the sensor system. Uh, you get a status uh, uh, on what the sensor is. Uh, you can calibrate or reconfigure the sensor as need be. And then throughout the course of your mission, uh, you have uh, the ability to see that images are being captured and, and know that you're getting the data you need to be getting throughout the flight. There's also an example, this is um, another flight planner, but uh, similarly, you have the ability to see uh, uh, images are being captured and, and also a footprint of where those images are being captured. Uh, the, the PSDK integration is, is really the first step in, in terms of enabling data to be sent real time down to the, to the operator while it's in flight. So right now we're, we're providing status and health information uh, to ensure that you know, you know, when you by the time you've completed you your flight, you know that you've gotten the data you need to get. Uh, but this is just the first step. Where this is going longer term is the ability to uh, send results down to the ground um, while while the system is still operating. Ultimately, um, what's important, however, is that uh, given the different types of data that may be collected on the farm, aerial data is is just a, a one type. Uh, and, and most of our customers want to take this data and view it in the context of other data they may have, whether it's their planting data, uh, their soil uh, chemistry maps, yield data from last year. Um, so we put a lot of effort into making the data portable into different platforms. We have custom API integrations with uh, Trimble Ag software and Climate Field View, um, and the data is importable into a number of other uh, farm data management tools. Um, so anyway, that, that's a, a, a quick summary on, on, on us as a company and the, the technology uh, behind what we're doing. Uh, and at this point, I, I think we'll just, we'll go ahead and uh, open it up to questions. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, this is Matt from Slant Range. Uh, I'm gonna be heading up to Q&A here. We've got a lot of good questions coming in, so I think uh, we'll just jump right in. Uh, first one that came in was a question about the address. It's probably for you, Bill. Uh, it says, does the 1S or the 1P allow an interface via the SDK uh, that may be specific to payload SDK? Maybe you can speak to that. Uh, second part of the question is, uh, does it allow extraction of flight data for post-processing or operations certification? I'm um, assuming that means kind of a, a record of where it flew and where it sprayed. So maybe you can speak to that. Yeah, thanks, Matt. So uh, on DJI side, I don't believe we have an existing SDK for the Agrist platform right now. Um, but there should be a, an opportunity to, to export the flight data um, from the Agris application itself. Um, but let's circle back and I'll connect you with the Agris point of contact here in the U.S. And, and if you have additional questions, uh, I would direct to them as well. Sounds good. Thanks. Um, there's a question here uh, for Mike about uh, smart detection. Uh, is there a way to save the user trained analytics for use in other maps? That's a good question and an important point. Um, yeah, the answer is yes. And the, the point is that um, frequently uh, a user may be looking for uh, a signature or a pattern in a given field, like let's say it's a weed, uh, for example, they've, they've found in a field, uh, and they want to search the rest of their data sets uh, for that particular condition. Um, you can store that, that particular pattern or signature and, and search other data sets. Uh, with it, and that's that's really the intent of the tool. Got it. Thanks. Uh, next question: uh, Which software are you using for your analysis? Uh, maybe we didn't make that clear. I guess I can take that one. But this is uh, a software package that we developed in-house, kind of custom-made for our sensor systems, called PlantView. Uh, there's lots more information about it uh, on our website, of course. But everything that Mike showed today was um, processed within our tool called PlantView. Uh, next question is, could you explain the meaning of lodged plants? 
So lodged plants, um, I guess there's there's different terms, but depending on what crop you're working in, but basically a, a plant that has been knocked over, um, either due to usually wind um, or sometimes from from uh, wildlife walking through walking through fields. So it's called green snap and, and some other crops. But once the plants are knocked down to the ground, that they're, they're no longer uh, uh, contributing to yield. Yeah, and I think a good point there uh, is that you know typically the the side of the plant once it's fallen over, you know, typically has a different signature than the top of the plant, and that's you know part of what we use to identify that condition. Yeah, and I'll uh, I'll, I'll make an uh, let me just add on that. Um, you know, for for uh, crop insurance purposes, uh, you know, wind events are are relatively common, and particularly in crops like corn, uh, that are susceptible uh, to lodging or green snap. And the ability to quickly go out there and assess the fraction of the field that has been affected by green snap or, or lodging, uh, it's a really effective full, uh, tool for crop insurers. Thanks. Uh, next question is Slant Range planning to offer webinar type training sessions for best practices uh, using the 3PX sensor? Um, I can probably answer that one, and, and yes, indeed. Uh, I mean, you've probably all seen where we're kind of ramping up our, our webinar content, um, but we've also um, are planning to roll out some plans for uh, kind of email communications on user tips, best practices, case studies. Um, so you'll see a lot of that uh, coming out in the coming days. Second part of the question is, can you tell us a bit more about your new partnership with Microsoft? Uh, so, Micah, maybe I'll let you take that. Um, it's a lot to say there, but maybe a, a quick quick comment. Yeah, there is, there's a lot to say there. And um, so as I talked through in, in the slides, what we described is, uh, you know, our approach to processing data is, is what we call edge analytics, which is to push all the processing out to low power computing devices in the field, low power, low cost devices. Um, and that's how we have developed our system. Uh, if you do have cloud connectivity um, <clears throat> and, and Microsoft, First of all, is is really interested in in agriculture and in, in particular in advancing the cause of agriculture. But they've got some fantastic tools for uh, a couple of things. One, um, pushing far more advanced analytics um, to the edge uh, computing device. So uh, one of the things we're doing is is implementing far more advanced uh, data products uh, and processing more efficient processing on those edge devices. Um, the second piece is around data security and uh, making sure, especially for larger uh, enterprise growers who are concerned about data security uh, across their across their operations, making sure that that data that is collected, uh, processed, and delivered, um, there it's it's secure throughout the process. Um, so Microsoft's got a lot of tools uh, for for both of those uh, aspects, and we're working with them to to implement some of these things. Thanks. Uh, next question. Um, question about radiometric calibration. Uh, some drone-based remote sensing networks promote the use of ground calibration panels. Uh, can you talk to that, Mike? Yeah. So that's that's the traditional way this has been done. And and the the fact that people are using ground calibration panels, it 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 kind of illustrates the point in being able to correct your measurements for changing sunlight conditions. Uh, and ground panels, uh, they 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 work great, except if you need to cover uh, relatively large areas, because they're only really effective for the image uh, in which the ground panel uh, is is present. Uh, if people aren't familiar with a ground panel, it's it's basically a a, a panel that sits on the ground and and it, you have a, it has a known reflectance, uh, so you know how to correct your image for it. But if you're covering large acreages and you have changing conditions throughout the course of your flight. Uh, you're not going to have a reflectance panel in every image, um, and especially when you start talking, you know, longer term around uh, beyond line of sight operations, where uh, once regulations are put in place and, and they're changing quickly, once you have the ability to send a, a system out to cover much more uh, area in a flight, uh, it's going to be essential to be able to do these calibrations without the need for ground panels. Got it. Thanks. Uh, there's a couple of questions here related to uh, basically other platforms. We talked a lot about the the 3PX and the M200 series today, um, but questions about uh, you know are we compatible with other drone aircraft? Uh, maybe you can quickly speak to that, Mike. 
Yeah, our system was developed initially um, to be agnostic to the platform. Um, so our, our sensor systems include GPS. They include uh, an internal it's a navigation system. It includes the calibration feature. Um, so they're they're entirely self-contained from a data point of view. That you know the way they were designed was just give it a mechanical mount to to any drone that can carry it, uh, and you've got uh, an agricultural intelligence system. Uh, and that that really our our three P sensor system is designed to be to mount it to just about any drone system, and that and that's really flexible. Um, uh, at the same time, though, the uh, that adds redundancy to some flight systems. And if you have a tight integration with the aircraft, uh, you can do a lot more things. And that's illustrated by the three PX and the integration there. Uh, in that particular case, uh, when you do have a tight integration with the aircraft, you start being able to access uh, data in flight. Both the user on the ground can see uh, flight data. The sensor can access aircraft data while it's in flight to to to, uh, uh, to conduct onboard analytics. Um, so there, there's advantages to both. Um, on the one hand, we do have systems that you can put basically on any drone uh, and, and operate. On the other side, the tight integration with the, the M200 series through the PSDK integration uh, enables uh, more efficient data collections because you do have that data visibility in flight. Thanks, and maybe a, a follow on here. A few questions on price, we didn't address that. Uh, maybe Bill, you can quickly talk about uh, pricing on the M200 series. Uh, I can tell you quickly the the three PX is five thousand two hundred and fifty, uh, but Bill, maybe you can share the the pricing for the aircraft. Sure. So on the M two hundred series, you're looking at about six thousand starting, six to seven thousand starting, up to ten thousand, depending on which model of the M two uh, M two hundred series. Got it. Thanks. Uh, question here: Is it possible to detect leaf area removed by hail or insects? Uh, maybe you can talk about our vegetation fraction layer, Mike. Yeah, so one of the data products we, we produce is, as Matt just mentioned, called vegetation fraction. And one of the examples I showed um, in, the, in the presentation was uh, basically removing background soil or non-growing vegetation and, and then re removing weeds to just focus on, on the corn uh, for analysis. So part of that step, again, is, is removing, um, you know, non-growing or non-crop vegetation uh, from, from the imagery. And, and when you do that, what's left is you get a ratio of the growing plant canopy or the crop canopy uh, to, to the total ground area. And that ratio that we call vegetation fraction is basically a measure of can canopy, uh, canopy cover. So... Uh, and one of the, the aerial phenotyping products that we produce, we're tracking vegetation fraction throughout the course of the growing season from emergence all the way to canopy closure. Um, if you do have a pest condition, uh, if you have a, a lodging event, like I said, uh, the vegetation fraction is the number or the, the data product that you would look at uh, to see how, how that had been, in, uh, how your canopy had been affected in terms of percent loss. Thanks. A uh, couple questions here on uh, resolution or what we call ground sample distance, GSD, as well as area coverage. Uh, I can probably quickly speak to that just as a reference. Um, at 100 meter altitude, uh, the 3P and the 3PX provide a four centimeter GSD uh, or, or resolution. Um, and then in terms of area coverage, uh, again, given the, the relatively low overlap that we can process our data, um, covering 100 acres, uh, you know, depends on your altitude, of course, but, you know, a nominal flight might be on the order of, say, 20 minutes or so. Um, so just kind of give you a ballpark, uh, but we can talk to you about specific details if you'd like. Um, another question here, how much time passes between in-flight data collection and map processing? So maybe, Mike, you can talk about kind of the whole timeline of the workflow. Yeah, so building on, on your on your comment there, just about uh, resolution and, and area coverage, and, and it's an important point that the, the two uh, trade off. So um, some of our data products, like when we're counting individual plants, uh, may require higher resolution, and that, that mer merely means flying at a lower altitude. Um, but at, at about 100 meter altitude, when you have four centimeter resolution, you're kind of, you know, uh, later, mid to late season growth, um, you might cover 100 acres, um, 
relatively quickly. And, and for some of the more basic data products like vegetation fraction or stress or NDVI, um, you know, you're looking at maybe less than 10 minutes to to produce that result uh, in the field. Um, more advanced data products take a little bit longer to process, but not substantially. Uh, plant counting uh, and sizing is one of the more more computationally intensive processes. Thanks. Um, I guess there's a couple of general questions on working with us, uh, either as resellers or service providers. Uh, I think for those, I just invite you to take a look at our website. Um, we've got a page dedicated to to resellers, uh, as long as some other, some other resources for providing service. Uh, so I think I just direct you to our website there. Um, can you provide emails for for Mike and Bill? Yes, we can do that. Uh, feel free to just contact us. Um, I guess sales at Slant Range is probably the best, and I can direct you to the right people. Um, let's see. I can address some of these. Question about uh, can it be trained to assess uh, tree health? Uh, maybe you can make some comments on analytics for trees. Yeah. So, so some of the products we're, we're showing. Um, are kind of are applicable to uh, any green vegetation. What we're what we're looking at in terms of when a when a plant comes under stress, one of the first things it, it does is it starts slowing down uh, photosynthesis. And and what we perceive on that is a reduction in, in chlorophyll. And and we we can measure that by the amount of light that is is being absorbed by chlorophyll in the plant. Uh, so whether you're talking about corn or soybeans or or a tree. Uh, you know that that change in chlorophyll content that is indicative of stress uh, becomes apparent in the measurement. Um, so that's that's applicable across different crop types. More specific to to trees or to orchards, uh, we can look at canopy density. Um, you know, one of the features of low altitude systems like this is to actually look at the the leaf density within the, the tree perimeter, um, and that's that's related to the vegetation fraction product that I just spoke about a minute ago. Um, we can also, uh, you know, do, you know, tree counting, um, and, uh, I think those are, those are some of the, the key features around, uh, tree management. Got it. Thanks. Um, so question here, we're currently using a 3PX on an M210. Uh, how important are ground control points and, uh, do you have a solution for RTK? So the second question, RTK, uh, yes, we do. We have a we have a package, um, an add-on package for for RTK. Uh, I, I guess the the quick answer is is it it depends on what your application is. Um, the system includes a built-in GPS uh, and an inertial navigation system. So at any particular point in time, when the system collects an image, it knows where it was and where it was pointed, so we can put that image on the ground. Uh, the question becomes how accurate do you need that to be done? Uh, RTK GPS <clears throat> is one piece of the problem um, that allows you to, to, to know where your, your sensor was in space, uh, reducing the error from normal GPS, which might be on, on a couple of on the meter on the order of a couple of meters down to, you know, on the order of centimeters. Uh, the, um, the other important variable that a lot of people don't recognize is the attitude or the pointing angle. Of, of the system, and that is often a larger error than GPS by itself. So you kind of have to solve both problems at once, um, and that's what people will often use ground control points for. Uh, to get back to the, the, the initial question, though, they're not necessary, um, uh, but it depends what you're trying to do. We do have customers who have very specific applications where they're trying to pinpoint the location of a plant within a few centimeters, uh, and in, that, in those cases, uh, you know, ground control points uh, kind of assist on on the uh, the pointing angle, um, but anyway, yes to RTK. Uh, but if you have more questions on that, please please get in touch. Thanks. Uh, maybe kind of a related follow on, but uh, how accurate are your individual plant counts on small research plots? If they're so, we we have a <clears throat> some studies have been done on this, and if they're done at the right uh, stage of growth. Um, they're within a couple of percent. Um, so, again, there, there, there's a lot of a lot of data on this. And when I say the right stage of growth, we're typically somewhere in the V2 to V3 range. Um, once the plants start encroaching on each other and overlapping, 
Um, we have some some tools that enable to account uh, still, but uh, the uh, the accuracy falls off once you start closing uh, the canopy along along the rows. Yeah, and just to add there, I mean, Mike's comments there were obviously specific to corn. Uh, a, a lot of our plant counting work is in corn, as you might imagine, but uh, we've applied it to uh, at least a dozen crops or so as well. So we can, again, provide some details on that if you'd like to contact us. Yeah, uh, let me, let me add on that as well, Matt. Sure. Matt um, yeah, as, yeah, as you mentioned, corn, but specifically to aerial phenotyping for, for test plots, um, corn, soybean, wheat, uh, Cotton have been our our focuses, um, and and we have customers using those today. Um, plant counting is possible with corn and and cotton. Um, high, extremely high density crops like uh, soybeans and and wheat. Uh, there are different approaches uh, to coming at population, which are, are what we call subtractive approaches, um, where you can't individually resolve and count every every plant, uh, but you're looking more for gaps in, in rows and things like that. But for corn and cotton, it is a positive individual counting method for each plant. Got it, thanks. Uh, another kind of uh, higher level question on, on flight planning. Uh, do you fly your missions in autonomous flying mode or are they hand flown by a pilot? They're always autonomous. The um, <clears throat> It's not only easier on the operator, but it's, it's just, uh, a lot more precise uh, flying um, can be done uh, with with an automated flight. So always always autonomous. Yeah, and Mike showed a, a couple of options. Um, those are the ones that have specific integration with the 3PX via the payload SDK. Uh, but there are certainly many other options uh, that can work. Uh, you know, just for flight planning with our sensors. Uh, question here: What are the spectral bands that you are collecting, and can they be customized? Yes, they can be customized. We have a standard configuration that places the bands at uh, six, or sorry, 550 nanometers, which is right, uh, there's a little bump in the green uh, spectrum, at 650, which is red, uh, 720, which is on the red edge, as it's known, and then uh, 850, which is up into the near infrared range. But uh, that's kind of a standard configuration, um, but we have plenty of customers uh, that request uh, special configurations and they, they know exactly what they want and for those customers we say anywhere between about 450 nanometers and, and maybe up to as far as 900 nanometers um, just give us a call and we can talk over your application um, uh, but that that is something we do all the time thanks uh, question here about drone deploy uh, can I upload data directly to drone deploy um, I can probably speak to that. We've got um, a variety of integrations with Drone Deploy. Um, the first being basically what this question is asking. So yes, you can take our raw imagery um, with all of the calibration components applied, of course, but you can take that imagery and stitch it in Drone Deploy if you'd like. Uh, that's fully supported. You can also process uh, the imagery within SlantView, our software package, to take advantage of uh, the low overlap and some of the customized analytics we provide, and then take those maps so rather than the imagery, just take the completed maps uh, in GeoTIFF format and upload those to your drone deploy account and kind of take advantage of, uh, you know, the device syncing and the archiving and the sharing within drone deploy. Um, and then, of course, the, the third piece is what we talked about today on the, the flight planner side, um, both in terms of the 3PX integration, uh, but also kind of this, um, you know, ag-centric uh, front end to the flight planner where we ask you some questions about, the data you're trying to produce and you know kind of some parameters about the plants and then we give you some guidance on a recommended flight plan so a variety of integrations uh, with drone deploy and uh, most if not all those are, are written up on our blog uh, let's see uh, can we get a copy of this recording uh, absolutely that will be going out to everybody um, can a grid of research plots be layered over the imagery uh, maybe you Mike you can talk to that um, so we, we do a, a, actually quite a bit of work in, in research plots and uh, our typical method here is um, if the grid of, of you know, the, 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 the plot locations is provided to us, we will deliver the results for each of those individual plots. Um, uh, that's, that's the most efficient operation. Um, if you want to overlay a grid on, on the uh, 
on a on an ortho mosaic. Uh, that's that's a more traditional approach, but um, there are reasons uh, for doing it the way we're doing it. That that kind of uh, leapfrog uh, some artifacts that are created by ortho mosaics uh, that have contributed to errors in in, in plot. Uh, analysis uh, previously. So, again, if you're if you're interested in, in test plot work, uh, we do have a unique approach. But ultimately, what we we will deliver is if you give us the grid uh, locations, we will basically return both the imagery but also a spreadsheet of of results for uh, each of those individual plots. Thanks. Uh, can SlampView be used with other sensor platforms? Um, uh, that that's something we're working on. We get that question uh, frequently, and uh, at the moment, uh, right now, we're, our analytics are are only working with with uh, our sensor systems. Um, and when we got started, there there were no other sensor systems on the market that we thought were adequate for the types of analytics that we wanted to run. Uh, and that's that's part of the reason we put the sensor together. Um, as uh, useful other you know alternatives come online. Uh, we are developing analytics for those, and uh, without getting into specific names or anything, we we do have um, uh, other other partners uh, with different types of sensing systems that are interested in our analytics, and we are actively working on those, and and we will announce them when when they're available. Got it. Thanks. Uh, question here: Is there any limit on the usage of Slant View? Whether it's uh, the downloading of files, processing of imagery per acre, per map charges. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the the pricing plans and and how they work. Yeah. So our our model is um, unlimited processing, um, unlimited installs on on your on your whatever machines you want to want to run it on. So uh, our license is just attached to the sensor. So as much data as you want to process, as much data as you can collect with that sensor, uh, it's up to you. Um, but we do have um, our our software tiers, um, basically from a, a all inclusive pro level uh, down to um, a basic uh, pre processing utility. And Matt, maybe you can comment on on the pricing there. Yeah. Um, so. Basically, our plans range from about $150 a month to about $375 a month, uh, again, depending on the tier you choose and also the duration. So we have six-month and 12-month plans that are obviously kind of intended to align with your growing season. Um, those are all posted on our, our online store, and you can have a look there. Um, question here about uh, is there a minimum laptop configuration uh, recommended for processing? Um. Again, it depends a little bit on your application. I, I think we would recommend at least uh, eight gigabytes of RAM. Um, other than that, I mean, it uh, you'll you'll get your results a little bit faster if you if you uh, uh, have a higher processor uh, speed. But um, you know, typically the minimum configuration that we recommend is about eight gigs of RAM. Yeah, and again, an important point there is, uh, you know, you, you certainly don't need to to run this on a workstation back at the office. I mean, a, a laptop, you know, a, a decent laptop uh, is fine. And as Mike said, I mean, the more horsepower you throw at it, I mean, the faster it'll process. Uh, but you certainly don't need anything too special. Uh, it actually runs quite well on a, a Microsoft Surface, um, so that's a, a nice option for portability as well. Um, what is the maximum wind speed allowed to capture good quality data from a Trees 200? Um, I guess, Bill, maybe you can talk about you know general flight dynamics, and I mean, Mike, you can probably comment on you know some of the software capabilities we have to deal with wind. Yeah, so on the EGI side, uh, our recommended flight for the uh, excuse me, the, our recommended wind um, speed flight is is 24 miles per hour for the M200 series, but um, in practice, we've seen people go over that. Um, it, it really does depend. I, I don't know if uh, Mike, on your side, uh, from a from an agricultural perspective, if there's uh, if you guys have best practices. Yeah, we well we recognize um, you know across most most much of the uh, the U.S. Midwest, uh, particularly early season, kind of late spring, early summer, you you might have regular winds up to 30 miles an hour, um, and we have customers operating systems in those in those conditions regularly. Um, what does it affect? 
primarily um, the efficiency of the data collection because you, you end up spending a lot of battery power fighting the wind. Um, so you, you, you get reduced area coverage a little bit. Uh, but again, the system includes um, uh, a pointing knowledge and, and position. So uh, even as it, the system might be fighting the wind and pointing a little bit off angle, uh, we, we know that information and it can handle it appropriately in the data processing. Thanks. Uh, another one for you, Bill. Uh, for the 210 RTK, is ground geofencing required? Uh, not, not to my knowledge. Uh, I guess I'll quickly comment here. I know we're uh, coming up on, I guess, a little over five minutes over. Uh, we got a ton of questions here. I think we'll take a few more and then maybe wrap it up and we can follow up on some of these other questions. Um, question here, how are the sensors powered? Do they require external battery mounted to the drone? So the PSDK, one of the great things there is that the, the PSDK interface with the Skyport uh, delivers power uh, through the mount. So. Um, we're just pulling power from from the aircraft through through the the mount. Um, on the non PSDK versions, um, depending on the implementation, in most cases uh, we have integrations and kits that will just pull power um, uh, from the aircraft batteries using a you know a part of the integration kit. Uh, but yeah, the the, the power is uh, external to the sensor system. Uh, question here, do you have an example of the area coverage difference using the 3PX uh, versus the competition? Uh, we've got a, a really good blog post on this, so I'd direct you to our blog. Um, just important point there is, um, you know, when you're comparing area coverage, you know, as Mike explained very well in the webinar, you know, it's very uh, important to think about the resolution that's required to achieve the data you're trying to produce. Uh, so it's important to kind of compare these sensors uh, at the altitude that they produce equivalent resolution. Um, maybe that's a little wordy, but again, there's a good uh, write-up on our blog, so I direct you there. Um, I guess a general question maybe on the 200 series for you, Bill. Um, how long can they fly? What's the flight time? So without a sensor and the TB55 batteries, we're looking at about 38 minutes of flight time. Uh, now with a sensor, you'll probably get about 26 to 28 minutes. Got it. Thanks. Um, Mike, you mentioned our published uh, chlorophyll algorithm that we use. Um, what is it and is it publicly available? Um, I know the one we generally use is by uh, Gittleson. Uh, we can certainly share that. I don't know if you have any other comments on that, Mike. Yeah, so that, that's, you know, that's not a, a slant range algorithm for the chlorophyll. There's, there's plenty of academic research uh, out there done by experts on, on uh, Kind of correlating um, true chlorophyll uh, measurements with, through tissue samples with aerial measurements, uh, and the Gittleson paper from 2005 is one that we commonly use. But um, this frequently comes up with some of our research customers that uh, they have a preferred formula that, that that they'd like to implement, and that's something that we can do. But uh, uh, the Gittleson um, uh, model from from 2005 is what we we currently implement. And if there anybody's right, interested, we're we'll happy to share that paper. Yeah. Uh, maybe one last question here, and we'll wrap it up. Uh, but how narrow can the bandwidth be for the custom filters? Ten nanometers. And um, this is if you're interested in custom configurations. Again, this is uh, give us a call and talk to us about it because there there are some considerations. Um, they can go as low as ten nanometers, but there's uh, some things that need to be considered in, in doing so. Got it, thanks. Um, so we're 10 minutes over now. I think we'll probably wrap it up here. Uh, great Q&A. Again, there's uh, many, many more that we didn't quite get to, and we'll, we'll try to follow up on as many as we can. Um, so again, I'll, I'll thank DJI for uh, you know hosting this today and including us. And uh, I don't know, Mike and Bill, if you have any closing comments. I, just, I would just say thank, thanks again uh, to DJI and, and to Bill for, for all the intro material and, and for including us here. Yeah, likewise, thank you for joining us today. And uh, we'll be sure to share the, the webinar recording uh, after, after the call as well. Awesome. If that's it, then thank you again for joining us today. And uh, we hope to see you soon. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.